Having a streamlined procurement process and a clear procurement strategy is essential to ensure your organization is able to meet its business goals, ranging from profitability to sustainability and more. This is Smart Consulting Sourcing, the only podcast about consulting procurement or how to buy consulting services. You'll get tips on how to use consulting, buy consulting, and managing the consulting. Tips and tricks from the pros. Let's do this. This is Smart Consulting Sourcing. And now your host, Ellen Lafitte. Hello and welcome back to Smart Consulting Sourcing, the only podcast about consulting procurement. I am Hélène and today we'll be discussing how to build the right consulting agreement. However, before that, let me give you a recap of last week's session. Purchasing consulting services is an important part of any company's business strategy. This can be difficult, with many companies choosing one extreme or another, some treating them like any other purchase, while others blindly following principles no matter what the situation may entail. However, there are still best practices that all firms should follow so as not only to make sure your investment pays off, but also to reduce risk involved in doing so. When purchasing consulting services, you're purchasing more than just a service. You're comparing what's on the inside, the approach and the methodology they employ. When you buy a tangible product, it won't matter to you how it's made or anything, but when you buy consulting, you care about almost everything and that's what makes it so specific. However, this week I want to discuss about how to build the right consulting agreement. First things first, let me define a consulting agreement. So a consulting agreement is a contract between a company and a consulting firm or individual consultant. The consulting agreement's goal is to specify the consulting services to be delivered, the payment conditions, and other key aspects. Businesses frequently employ consulting agreements to outsource certain jobs or projects. A client could engage a consultant to assist with marketing research or product development, for instance. Individuals who are self-employed or have their own consulting firm can also use consulting agreement. The consulting contract in this scenario will specify the consulting services to be given as well as the price arrangement. But there are many other aspects that you should add to your consulting agreement. So how to build the right consulting agreement? No matter what type of consulting where you need, it's important to have a clear and legally binding consulting agreement in place. And I would recommend working with your legal team. And if you work regularly with consultants, to have a consulting agreement template. Without a consulting contract, there could be confusions about expectations or misunderstanding about the terms of work, which could lead to conflict down the road. In most cases, a consulting agreement has four dimensions. The first one being the statement of work, which outlines what will be accomplished during the project. This is the first step when you draft a contract. You need to transform the proposal into a SLW that will lay down the expectations for the project. The purpose of the SOW statement of work is to ensure that the consulting providers commit to the results rather than the means. If the performance does not meet your expectation, the element in the contract will serve as a reference in a potential litigation. This document outlines the scope of the project, the deliverable, the schedule, and the expected outcome. It also includes governance and escalation procedures in case things go off track. The statement of work forms the basis of the consulting agreement, so it's important to get it right. Once you've got a draft document, sit down with your consultants and go through it by line by line. Make sure they understand what's expected of them and that you're both on the same page about the project deliverables. You may go on how the consulting firm will be compensated once you specify what they've intended to perform. And this brings us to our second dimension of framing the right consulting agreement, the payment terms, or how and when payments will be made. The contract should spell out exactly how the consultants will be compensated. Make sure you understand the quantities and the conditions that come with it. For instance, if you're opted for a flat fee, be clear on the total amount to be paid. If you're using hourly rates, which I don't recommend for management consulting work, by the way, include the precise amounts for each type of consultant, the type of cap, hard or soft, and the number of hours required to meet the cap. 
And finally, if you want to have a risk sharing model, define the variable compensation, the metrics on which the variable compensation is based and how they will be monitored. Make sure the terms you're negotiating are in line with your company's policies. A little tip here for the beginners, the price stated in the contract is often the net price before sales tax. Set a deadline for when payments must be made. Standard terms are generally 30 to 60 days from the date of invoicing, but it can be longer. Make sure they respect the local regulation though. Some countries like those in the EU have started limiting the payment terms. Define the payment schedule such as weekly, monthly, phase, lump sum, milestone based or delivery based. Large projects spanning over six months should, should examine the monthly table, for instance. You can also add the fees description in the appendix. Another tip is to use an incentive for early delivery and or a penalty for late delivery while working on a time sensitive project. And this brings us to our third dimension of building the right consulting agreement, which is delivery guidelines, which are, include how the job will be completed. Starting with the first guideline, the confidentiality agreement. You don't want the consultant to inform everyone about the project you worked on. Examine the contract's intellectual property and confidentiality terms carefully. The wording of these provisions should be determined on a project by project basis. If you have any worries about a particular type of sensitive information, set it down in plain English in the contract. Make sure you're aware of the restriction of confidentiality agreements, especially if you work internationally. Confidentiality is approached and regulated differently in each culture or country. You should also be aware that secrecy should be limited in both time and place. If you operate with sensitive data, you almost certainly have stringent security needs, which you should specify in the contract. The components can include, for instance, data and information management, such as information security policies. It could be that any consultant present on your premises or and working on your data must be onboarded and vetted, like in vendor onboarding or vetting standards, or that you need to ensure the consultant's safety while on your site, and we're talking about health and safety policies. Intellectual property is also a very important topic. The customer owns the materials created during the project, the presentation, the reports, etc. The consulting company's techniques and tools, on the other hand, may be built on pre-existing intellectual capital established over time by the firm. In that instance, the IP will remain the property of the consulting provider and the customer should negotiate the right to freely utilize the results. You should also request the data obtained on your behalf during the project, such as the models created for the project or the interview transcripts. Don't be satisfied with only the finished results. You also need to figure out how to deal with third parties. The majority of consulting firms collaborate with outside partners and subcontractors. You have the option of being notified if a third party is working on the project. Furthermore, you have the option of having them sign a specific NDA and trusting the cons or trusting the consulting firm to ensure that their partner or subcontractor follows the NDA they signed with you. If the consulting provider is already working with a rival or a customer of yours on some sensitive project, there may be a conflict of interest. You can negotiate exclusivity, but it usually comes with a hefty price tag. You might provide a list of individual firms or wider description of your rivals in your contract. You must add a non-compete provision if you do not want the consulting work firm to work with your competitors after the project is completed. And finally, we have our fourth dimension, which is escalation measure. Because you'll be thinking about the what-ifs and worker situation and coming up with numerous solutions, successful and effective planning will help you create the strategy and obtain a more holistic perspective on the project. When you start a project, everything may seem to be going well. But many things can change during the course of a long project. You should keep the changes to a minimum and make sure the terms and conditions stay the same. If any change occurs, you should track all modifications to avoid future arguments. A clause stating that the contract can only be altered in writing is recommended. The next thing is a contract's governing law, commonly known as option of law. 
It's an important component. If a problem occurs with your consulting service, keep in mind that your contract is always the first point of reference. You should confer with your legal counsel and ask yourself, what law will best safeguard our interest in a consulting agreement? Your consulting firm may have certain requirements in that front as well. Don't take them for granted and include them in the negotiation if required. In a consulting agreement, you will often see a limitation of liability each party can occur and a disclaimer of warranty. As a rule, you need to limit the risk for your company while entering this agreement. So in conclusion, consulting agreements are routinely used by companies working with consultants to define in details the services to be provided and the terms of condition. I strongly recommend to work with a legal counsel to dictate the terms of the contract instead of using blindly the template from the consultant. Your consulting agreement should include four important elements. The statement of work, which outlines the expectations and how success will be measured. The payment terms, included how and when payment will be made. The delivery conditions, including the confidentiality, intellectual property liabilities and warranty aspects. And the escalation measures, including what will be done in a, if a problem arises. And that marks the end of a podcast. Next week, I want to talk about why measuring the performance of consultants matters. So stay tuned. Until then, stay safe and happy sourcing. If you have other questions about building the right consulting agreement, remember you can always contact me directly on LinkedIn or by email because I'm always game for a chat. Bye and see you next week. Au revoir. You've been listening to Smart Consulting Sourcing. The only podcast about consulting procurement and how to buy consulting services. Pro tips on how to use consulting, buy consulting, and manage it. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten some useful and practical information. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, hit the website at consultingquest.com. Check out the blog at consulting.wiki and find the ebook Smart Consulting Sourcing, a step by step guide to getting the best ROI from your consulting. Available on Amazon and other online sellers. Find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. For questions and comments, send an email to ellen.lafitte at consultingquest.com. See you next time.